What is realism in real-time toy world rendering? The general belief seems to be that cinema is the best model for virtual worlds, that realism means cinematic realism. This is not true. Ecological realism is much more important. The mistaken emphasis on cinematic realism is behind the risible belief that real-time ray tracing is only interesting when, say, 100 rays per pixel can be traced. In fact, the primary advantage of tracing as opposed to rasterization is seen with one ray per pixel, per pixel, or even fewer. Tracing is robust to geometric complexity, while rasterization is not. For which reason rasterized toy or virtual worlds have always been impoverished in geometric detail, Let's develop some intuitions about the algorithmic complexity of the tracer in complex environments, abstracting away from the tedious details of the implementation. But first, the tedious details. The tracer traces the world each frame. The world is a voxel, an object which knows how to shade rays inside itself. For each ray R, the tracer calls the procedure world.shade R. A ray is not an object, only a record. A voxel may be a textured cube, a mirror block, a cube of transparent color, a cellular automaton, a swirling cloud, an octree or 27 tree acceleration structure, or anything else, actually, so long as it shades rays and returns. Among the cubes of Starfield, one draws blue blocks, first staccato, and then in line segments. There are also invisible changes to the structure of space, without which the visible changes could not occur. A large hole is excavated with a special kind of block. It is almost empty, but it has black edges. Unlike empty space, it splits visibly. A blue block here shows the structural change induced by its drawing. A line of blocks induces more structure, and so on. Let's think about the computational complexity along a single ray, and assume, for the time being, that there is no CPU cache. At each intersection of the ray with the face of a voxel, marked by the black edges, there is a memory access. Tracing inside the voxel takes many machine instructions. Approximate the sum of these two costs with a constant, and now consider two volumes of space. One is empty of any subdivisions, the other has a thousand tiny cubes scattered inside it like dust modes. The ray traverses the first volume in one step, and the second in many steps. How many depends on exactly where the modes are in relation to the ray. Balancing this is the fact that a ray terminates when it hits opacity. If the modes are opaque, then the rays that hit them cease to cost but rays which closely graze them but do not hit them will be slowed since the subdivision of empty space is densest closest, closest to the modes. Now, now consider the performance of a parallelized version of the tracer on a multi-core CPU, this time with cache. The rays tracing the image, here called the retina, are divided into n tiles. n should be greater than m, where m is the number of CPU cores available. Each core renders some number of tiles, one after the other. Consider the memory locations touched by the rays in a single tile. Neighboring rays will hit almost the same set of voxels along their length. So cache coherency ought to help the performance of the tracer, as long as the tiles are small enough. By starting with a large tile, n by n, where n is a power of 2, and recursively dividing it along each both axes, we can be certain that the base tile is small enough that the memory touched by its rays will fit into CPU cache, more or less. We can try to understand the time costs of instructions and cache misses by rendering a scene which is certain to fit into cache, like this Sierpinski S cube fly-through. There are only 27 pointers in this structure, each of which points to to one of two objects, either the whole or the whole thing. And there is a base case object, 
the unit solid, which the shader draws when the estimated angular cost of the voxel or size of the voxel hit by the ray is below a certain threshold. So there are only three voxel objects, which are fairly small records, to keep in the cache, and the only time cost for this entire scene will be the, for the instructions, because the cache will contain it, contain the, the, every point you need. So uh, when we know that the time it takes to render this frame is just about the same as the time it takes to render many of the frames with much more complicated structure visible, we see that, in fact, the cache oblivious tracer is doing its job and that cache misses are not an important impact on performance for many scenes. For scenes where you're looking a long way and there's a lot of detail, this is not necessarily true. But frame rate is more important than resolution. So we know the cache oblivious retina, based on what I just said, is sometimes slower. I will assert that it's sometimes slower by a factor of up to two and a half or three. Now, because frame rate is more important than resolution, this cache oblivious parallel retina can be modified to trace at highest resolution only near the center of the retina. And the diameter of this phobia can be changed each frame to try to maintain a certain frame rate. So, when the scene is such that there are a few cache misses, the detailed region in the center of the retina, or the fovea, expands, and it contracts, leaving a blurrier out, outer region of the retina when the scene is such that cache misses are important, and the frame tends to trace slower. Now, this is visible, quite visible, in a film. However, it's, it's less visible in the live tracer, because when you're con when the user is concentrating on the scene, he naturally pays attention to the center of the scene. <laughs> All right. Behold, then, the cache oblivious, foveated, paralyzed tracer running on a quad core i7 to i727k. Read it. A quad core i7. 2700K at about 100 milliseconds a frame or 10 FPS, which is sped up for the film. A higher frame rate is much better for interaction, but 10 is tolerable and foveation is more noticeable in the film, as I said. HTOP shows that all eight cores are loaded evenly and that the algorithm paralyzes quite well. Now, Nice Landing, coming out in 2014 from Intel, will provide 72 cores, and it is reasonable to assume that if the tracer were ported to nice landing, that it won't trace the rays any, the cores in nice landing will not trace any slower than the i7 cores do. So, and there are four physical cores in the i7. So it's reasonable to expect at least a 20-fold increase in performance on nice landing over i7. So, allotting a factor of 4 to frame rate, since example films are done at an insufficiently high frame rate, brings us up to about 40 frames a second, which is more than enough, and leaves us more than enough CPU performance to double the resolution in each of X and Y, um, which brings us up to a pretty good resolution. And at that point, I think there's no doubt that for something like Minecraft or Second Life, which is my particular interest, for, uh, for an online virtual 3D world built out of voxels, it is clearly better than any rasterized render could ever be at that point. And probably soon thereafter, it will be better for all 3D applications.